Hello beautiful people, welcome to my channel. You are in my book playlist. And in this video, we will continue on with the book titled Three Magic Words by U.S. Anderson. We're now getting ready to move into the next chapter titled Form. I am Daisy, your hostess. If you're new to my channel, welcome, welcome. So glad you found us. And if you'd like to catch up with the other chapters, please make sure you visit my book playlist so you can access them. Before I turn the page to our next section, I will share a recap regarding my highlights from the previous chapter titled Mind. There were so many good sections, I didn't know where to start, and it's always such a refreshing thing to come back to a loved book and find new things and see them in a different way. One of the things that the author talked about was the functions of the conscious mind. And he described the conscious mind as a recording, analyzing, and the instrument of sensation where we file all these things. And we file them in two compartments, one in the compartment of our pain center and the other one in the compartment of our pleasure center. And of course, things that are in our pain center are put in there as prompters to remind us as we go throughout life, what are the things that we want to stay away from and to help us avoid that. And the things in our pleasure centers remind us of those prompters that are going to bring us towards those things that bring us pleasure and the things we want to move towards. The next section worth bringing up is titled The Eternal Substance, where the author quotes from the Bible, the book of Genesis, in the beginning, the word. And in, in there, the way that I interpret it, he was sharing the, uh, the concept and the idea that God as eternal creator, infinite, um, there is no beginning, there is no end. But in sense, what it's referring to is the beginning of the physical universe as we know it. And in as much, we've come a long way since the many discoveries of science now have revealed that there is no such thing as a solid mass. And that has changed the way that we as, as human beings and our scientists continue to evolve knowledge from these bases before it was just electron and protons and then guess what they discovered the atoms and from there all the things that have come since then debunking previous theories and then with that discovery of the atom and the splitting of the atom mass and energy are one that's pretty mind-boggling when we start to think about the things that we see, the space in between us, and even us ourselves. It comes down to that there is only one substance or one energy or one intelligence in all things. The bottom line, an invisible power that moves within us, around us, and everywhere. As for myself, I had to sit with this for a few minutes to really absorb it, to ponder on it, and to understand how we are one. The connection that we have is so bounded like a, a cloth, but it's like, like a moving cloth that you would only see in some type of you know magic movie, right? The other part that I thought was worth uh, noting down was the topic on hypnosis and suggestion. And I the way that I interpret it, the subconscious mind being what I would understand as the author is sharing, the God center, the one mind of us all, while the conscious mind is the specific individualized minds of each one of us separately. This conscious mind has these compartments, the pain compartment and the pleasure compartment, and inside it's got these little regulators called prompters or little memories that will remind us, oh, this experience caused me too much pain, so I will say no to this, I'm afraid of that, etc., etc., or hey, I really love this, I'm, this makes me feel happy and I want to move towards this. And so we have these associations that we use, and these are inside our our, our memories. Now the way that I understood the subconscious part is it is all our minds put together. Everything that is, was, will be, it's all in there. And I see it as imagining electricity. Mind you, I'm not an electrician, so 
Please bear with me if I'm not using the right technical terms. Thank you in advance. And for electricity to be able to get through a certain amount of voltage, it has to go through these conductors that regulate the amount of volt that's going to go through it. Otherwise, it's going to short circuit the uh, the, the motherboard or the or the the outlet, whatever that is. And imagine if we are that outlet, and if we did not have the conscious mind to serve as that regulator the vast amount of knowledge and information and past present and future was it would be just so much for the human being as a physical self to to take in and that's why i believe that meditation allows us to trickle just the right amount of knowledge that we can and through auto suggestion which is part of the hypnosis chapter that he talked about uh, allows us to suggest to our mind and program the subconscious mind let me make sure i say that clear that the conscious mind who is aware has these prompters and these inhibitions can use to remove negative programming through suggestion through affirmation provide positive prompts that will open the valve to allow this energy to flow through keep in mind that this subconscious mind knows no good or evil that within it it just wants to create it just wants to to make that happen so many of these new age authors such as neville goddard and others and i do have a neville goddard book in my playlist please make sure to hit that up uh, it talks about the law of attraction you may already be aware how this law operates and just like civil laws not being aware of the law does not exempt you from being affected by the law so this creative force just creates what you will it to create because humans have free will the creation of good and bad is created by humans what you deem is good what you deem is bad and so your world as you look around it has been that creation of your desires inside of you and so there we have that part and that is so powerful to understand that there is a creative force that we can all tap into if we wish to create what we want and that we have been tapping into it by the way that we predominantly think and our convictions and that leads me to the next section which was about first cause as mental I sat back in my thinking chair and pondered on this for a bit and tried to understand what does that mean. And in as much the way that I interpret it is that everything is created in mind. And as we look around, whether it's the table, the house we're in, the car we drive, the things we see around town, it all generated in somebody's mind first. And so the conclusion is that everything around us is an effect the life that we see that is projected outside of us is an effect of the mental images that we have put into our mind through our thoughts and the minute that we decide and taking this a step further this is where that universal mind the word collective comes into play we are all playing with the same subconscious mind the same creative force and when we look around and at the quote-unquote what I call our playground earth we are seeing the representations and the effects of the collective thoughts of all of us and if you're not happy with the world as it is or if you're happy with the world as it is it is that you're connecting with a collective and you're seeing the results of that we are seeing that and as we begin to shift to the higher the pure the beautiful we can actually elevate our whole consciousness to that next level and so I believe, uh, in my opinion, if we see war, if we see strife, if we see fear and hunger and child abuse and all these things, it's that we still need a lot, lot further to go, understanding 
that there are still thoughts that are debased and you know fear mongering and we have not yet opened up to the power within that we can make that change and make that effort to auto suggest to our mind that we can access a beautiful life so before i move on to the next chapter i just want to quote something from the bible the book of sirach it's um number th chapter 3 verse 23 do not tire yourself in resolving useless questions since the knowledge you already have goes beyond human understanding that's so powerful that is so powerful my friend because right there it, it just brings it all home it's the knowledge that you have goes beyond human understanding you already have those words are powerful you already have the knowledge and it goes beyond human understanding have you ever had that experience where you know something in spirit but you you can't kind of express it in human words it happens to me all the time okay let's go on now to our next chapter titled form the universe hums like a great harp string resounding a mighty chord answering each thought by returning a thing from the place where all things are stored the universal law as far as the eye can see the mind project and the spirit perceive there is nothing but eternal and immutable law working with the tiniest unit of matter he can visualize man observes that the atom has a nucleus and moving parts which circle this nucleus in never-ending motion working with the largest unit of matter which he can visualize man observes that the solar system has a nucleus and moving parts which circle this nucleus in never-ending motion. How strange that the smallest and largest units we know are identical in their construction. Indeed, it is as if there were many mirrors in the mind, reflecting one eternal law in infinite gradation of size. No doubt, the atom contains many atoms of its own. No doubt, the universe is but a part of many increasingly greater universes. How small in loss we seem as we perceive the vast reaches of infinity. Yet all our perception exists in mind, and just as surely as we perceive them, we are the center of them. Our premise is that thoughts make things, and in order to substantiate such a transcendent truth, we must turn to the beginning of all form. What is the one basic substance that permeates all space and all time? If we take apart a substance and discover atoms, and we take apart the atom and unleash energy, we must eventually say that the basic thing behind all form and all creation is energy. What then is this energy? It obviously does not explode, helter-skelter throughout all space but rather becomes apparent only in matter or in movement, and always such matter or movement attains an intelligent existence or moves in an intelligent direction. The design and flow of all energy is such as to leave no doubt that basic and eternal in the universe are everlasting and immutable laws of action which alone account for the accumulation of substance into form. Inherent in these laws are movement and activation which set up the atom and the solar system alike, without regard to size. Indeed, lacking a specific viewpoint or a scale of relativity, the solar system and the atom are identical, as they assuredly must be in the universal subconscious mind. A Living Universe in this universal subconscious mind, this first cause, this infinite plan and energy, then, is the stuff from which all things are made. In its pure form, if indeed it is ever perceived as such, it is represented only by intelligent movement or by a word which seems much more concisely to describe it, law. 
if its first intelligible manifestation is in a center of force, which on the smallest scale we know is represented by the atom, and on the largest scale we know it represented by the solar system. And nothing extraneous to the law calls into being these centers of force. It is the nature of the law to manifest them, for the law is one of life and movement and energy, which by its own nature congregates itself into units of similar frequency in a vibrating universe. To consider this further, let us attempt to visualize all space as consisting only of vibration. We need not ask ourselves what it is that vibrates, nor postulate as to what causes the vibration. For the vibration is intelligence alone, and the force it exerts is of intelligence alone. The vibration is pure universal intelligence. The vibrations in pure universal intelligence are established on many different frequencies, and all vibrations of one frequency are inevitably attracted together to form a unit. This unit, the center of corresponding vibrations, we know as an atom, or as the solar system, the first sign of visible form, the first evidence of tangible matter, called into existence by the very nature of infinite law acting within and upon itself. The formed atom also sets up a vibration and seeks out other atoms of corresponding vibration, and in this coalescence of units vibrating on the same frequency, there is formed matter, as we know it in our physical world. Thus matter is formed from intelligence, and more important, intelligence is in matter. In fact, intelligence is matter. Since intelligence must be conscious, it is an indisputable fact that we are surrounded by a living universe that there is consciousness in all things. The consciousness of the atom. Now you must bear with this very necessary discussion of the beginning of things and the nature of substance, for we are out to show that thought calls form into existence, that form is no more than a part of the very intelligence that each of us lives in. Thomas Edison was extremely preoccupied with what he termed the obvious choice of the atom in its infinite acceptances and rejections of the myriad combinations of chemistry. When two chemicals were put together in solution and some of the atoms of one combined with some of the atoms of the other, Mr. Edison was forced to ask himself why those particular atoms and not some of the others, indeed, why any of the atoms at all. The only answer he could possibly conceive was that the atoms of each chemical exercised a conscious choice whether they would or wouldn't combine with the atoms of the other chemical. Now Mr. Edison certainly aired no views as to the self-consciousness of the atom, but only of the intelligence or consciousness of the atom. In other words, the ability of the atom to make a choice. The atom, the building block of the universe, is a center of force, and the atom is conscience. Working in accordance with law or universal intelligence, the atom seeks out other atoms which vibrate at a corresponding rate, and the coalescence of such atoms forms that which we designate as inanimate matter, water, earth, air, and minerals. Expanding Consciousness Now then, you may well say, this is all well and good as a plausible theory as to the formation of substance in a living universe, but how do you account for life? And let us repeat, the entire universe is alive. There is nothing dead, nothing inanimate. When Jesus said, God is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living, he was revealing the basic truth of all creation. For all is living, and all is intelligence, and all is conscience, and the great motivating force of all life is its attempt to expand its consciousness. In other words, it seeks to know itself. Though we can safely attribute consciousness and intelligence to the atom, there remains not the slightest possibility that the atom is self-conscious. In fact, all evidence points to the consciousness of the atom being of the lowest possible order. 
It chooses, but its choices are within the rigid scope of operating law. When a certain number of atoms begin vibrating together on a certain frequency and form, let us say, a rock, there is created in the rock a kind of consciousness which is on the infinitely lower scale than that of the atom. For the rock exhibits practically no ability to choose. Yet there can be no doubt but what there is actually a certain consciousness in the rock. For a group of conscious units must of necessity form a group consciousness. The rock exists, therefore it must be conscious. It consists of conscious intelligence and must then have some consciousness of its own, albeit so far below our level of consciousness as to be indiscernible to us. From the rock and sand and earth and water and air to the formation of the plain pleasure responsive amoeba, a thing that grows and feeds and reproduces itself, what gigantic step is this? Expanding consciousness. Only that and nothing more. First, we have energy moving according to law, congregating into centers of force by its own nature, setting up polarizing nuclei of positive polarity around which revolve electrons of negative polarity. These centers of force, or atoms, have lives of their own, our conscience. The nature of these little lives is to congregate with others vibrating on the same frequency and thus matter is called into existence, which is basically no matter at all, but merely units of intelligent energy. And secondly, we have all form consisting of many individual lives, building up to a conscious whole, building up to a conscious entity, which attempts to work out its own purpose. From these two conclusions, we go on to a third the form which results from the union of many individual lives or consciousnesses is the result of consciousness of the whole. In other words, the form of the rock is the result of the consciousness of the rock. The form of the amoeba is a result of the consciousness of the amoeba. And the form of the human being is the result of the consciousness of the human being. Life seeks to know itself. Now once again you may say, this all sounds reasonable enough, but where does this consciousness come from? The entire universe is caught up in a mighty work of expanding consciousness because it is the nature of universal intelligence to seek to know itself. God knows himself only as a thing. Before you shall blasphemy or irreverence, tarry a while and dwell on this premise. Visualize space. It goes on and on forever and ever. If your mind's eye, you retreat trillions of miles from the earth and draw a huge circle with the earth as the center and say, this indeed is all of space, what then is on the other side of your circle? The only answer is more space. Space as we know it, or infinite intelligence as we know it, or universal law as we know it, or the universal subconscious mind as we know it, cannot possibly have any limits or any boundaries. How is it possible for something which has no boundaries to ever know itself? In order for it to know itself, it must be able to say, I am this. And in order for it to say, I am this, it must become something with boundaries, something finite, a thing. And that is exactly what the universal subconscious mind is doing. It is becoming things. It is seeking an expanded self-consciousness. And that part of it, which has achieved the greatest self-consciousness, which we are able to observe, is the human being. What is evolution? It is life expanding to a conscious oneness with God. As time progresses and our consciousness expands, we are growing closer and closer to this attainment. Indeed, this is the clue to the mystery of life and evolution and the destiny of man. Have no fear of your smallness in relation to the vastness of limitless space, for there are no limits to the mind and there are no limits to expanding consciousness. 
the destiny of mankind is that man's consciousness will expand to the point where he is one with all creation. On this great day, it will be as simple for one man to be in thought, contact with another 5,000 miles away as it is now to speak to a friend in the same room. On this great day, the mind of man will span space and time and the limitations of form and existence will be solely of the spirit in one eternal now. The past, the present, and the future will be one. All space will be one. All form will be one. Man's consciousness will be the consciousness of God. Spirit into Matter All the great metaphysical and religious works speak of the evolution of consciousness as the descent of spirit into matter. The great allegory of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden is an illustration. The temptation or the serpent, the eating from the tree of knowledge, the final fall which culminated in awareness of self-speak only of the beginning of self-consciousness. This awareness of self as a thing of free choice was the beginning of man's consciousness choosing of modes of action and methods of thought. It was the beginning of error, the start of evil, the beginning of sin and punishment, all natural results of man's search for truth. The great universal subconscious mind, acting upon itself according to the laws of its own nature, sets up centers of force which are conscious and which attract other similar centers of force to form matter. This matter, by the very nature of its overall consciousness, the sum total of the consciousness of all of its atoms, resolves itself into a particular form and seeks ever to know more about itself. As its consciousness grows, it becomes a living, expanding, feeding and growing entity, that which we designate a living organism. As an organism, its consciousness expands with ever-increasing rapidity, so that within a relatively short time, the expanded consciousness or spirit can no longer tolerate the limitations of its form and abandons it. Thus is established the cycle of birth and death, such as exist in all living organisms. The process of evolution is now in high gear. The amoeba seeking to know itself unites with other amoebas and becomes a jellyfish. The jellyfish further develops its perception and consciousness and becomes a fish. The fish further develops its consciousness and becomes a mammal. The mammal further develops its consciousness and becomes a man. All along the path of evolution lie the many residual forms marking the way. For wherever consciousness reaches out to a higher level, there also consciousness remains behind. The very process of the conception and birth and growth of a human being, through the polywog, the amoeba, the low-scale vertebrate, the fetus, and finally the human infant, which grows into the magnificent consciousness of a man, illustrates with remarkable detail the entire path of the evolution of consciousness. Cosmic Awareness Thus it can be seen that the purpose of life is the attainment of knowledge, the expansion of consciousness, a constant reaching upward and outward and inward toward a oneness with God. Browning wrote, quote, Such men are even now upon the earth, serene amid the half-formed creatures round, who should be saved by them and joined with them. End quote. In Palestine, nearly 2,000 years ago, a man looked at his neighbors and said, Who hath seen me hath seen the Father. Adulterated and misconstrued, distorted and dogmatized, the magnificent consciousness of the man Jesus has been in the main but a confusing din on the ears of the deafened. I and my Father are one. One, one, one. One with all men, all life, all things, all substance. The attainment of the consciousness of the whole. The attainment of the consciousness of God. Form is but the result of consciousness. And consciousness is but the result of thought. And thought is simply a contact and a borrowing from the universal intelligence that pervades all things. 
Thought makes form. Thought makes things. Expanding spirit changes form. In this life, which ever seeks to know more about itself, which ever seeks an expanding consciousness, he would stop death would stay an infant forever. For as the spirit expands its consciousness, it seeks new form through which to express itself. The body which you now occupy is but an instrument of your consciousness, an expression of your knowledge of yourself. By the very nature of your being, your consciousness must grow, and as it does, your spirit will gradually lay down your body and return again into the universal subconscious mind once it starts anew in its quest for new expression. This, of course, brings us to the subject of reincarnation. When you have truly understood that there is only one life, only one mind, you will understand that this life incarnates itself billions of times over in its search to completely know itself. When you have understood this, reincarnation will be as obvious as knowing yourself, for you will know that there can be no life without an incarnation of the one life, which is in you, which is altogether you. One, eternal, and everlasting, that is the truth about yourself. And the terror that death holds for many is simply vain regret at losing the built-up errors and illusions of the conscious mind, which is the silliest and most illusory fear of all mankind. We shall cover a great deal more of this in the chapter on immortality. Law into its units of force, units of force combining into matter, the consciousness of matter determining its form, consciousness seeking self-consciousness, self-consciousness seeking the consciousness of the whole, the consciousness of God. This is the diagram of all life. For we are all one in reality, and our separateness is nothing but a necessary illusion in the plan by which the universal mind seeks to know itself by becoming a thing. The Eternal Presence Perception of the indwelling presence is often difficult to come by. The formative years of my own spiritual experience were certainly not spent in such knowledge. With sugar and I recall how sorely I must have tired the patience of Dr. Elton Trueblood, then chaplain of Stanford University, when that gentle and erudite man tried to lead me out of the maze of my own circuitous questionings, Dr. Trueblood's excellent books are legion, and even at that date, I had read a number of them. It was on the common ground of these texts and his own teaching in philosophy that we met afternoons in his study in the Stanford Chapel. Shafts of sunlight poured through stained glass windows as we settled in our chairs and explored territory we had covered many times. To my openly voiced doubt of the existence of God, Dr. Trublet offered the immense variety of religious experience undergone by men of high repute through the centuries. But they could have been deluded, I insisted. By whom? By themselves. Why would they delude themselves? Because they were afraid of their own smallness, afraid of oblivion at death. Dr. Trublet smiled. Strange that some of them were otherwise very brave men, he said. But certainly if God exists, somebody in all the centuries would have seen him. Many people have. Who? I, for one. You've seen God? Yes. Then what does he look like? Like everything. That means nothing. It means a great deal to me. I look at you and see God. Wherever my eye falls, I see God. He is as real to me as you are. More real, in fact, for he is the changeless in the changing, the immutable and ever-present spirit that inhabits all things. In my mind, those words still sound on the quiet air of the Stanford Chapel. Somehow, I sense the meaning in them, even though I did not understand them. And as the years gradually enlarged my consciousness, there came a day when I too looked on all things and saw God. On that day, my faith, weak and questioning as it might have been, was tempered by the steel of knowledge. Unity versus Separateness 
mental healing and creation of circumstance and form through thought may never be accomplished by him whose consciousness is one of separateness. But he who achieves the consciousness of the whole, the consciousness of God, may change form and circumstance and promote bodily healing through thought. For all things then will exist within him. This is the truth about Jesus. And he who shuts his eyes to the miracles of the man from Nazareth is blinding himself to the greatest truth which has ever been revealed to a searching and doubting world. For a man may walk upon the water, raise the dead, heal the sick, feed five thousand with seven loaves of bread, change water into wine, appear and disappear at will. Such is the destiny of man that these things will one day be commonplace. Such is the destiny of man, that one day there will be no necessity for form, for separateness, for differentiation in the mind of God. All will be one, complete unity, a subconscious universal mind. At this point, we beseech you not to isolate yourself in your room and attempt to move a chair by thought power, nor indeed to attempt to exert any of the powers of the mind that your consciousness has not as yet grasped. You must understand at once that it is not the impression of your will or your thought that will cause a chair to move without a physical force. It is only the final, all-encompassing consciousness, a oneness with the intelligence in which you and the chair both exist. This consciousness has been achieved already by a few individuals on a very few occasions. There is good reason to believe that these individuals and occasions are on the increase. Certainly on the lower echelons of demonstration, such as the healing of the human body through mind power, there have been a multiplicity of authenticated and accurately recorded phenomena, such as to remove all doubt of the supreme power of the universal subconscious mind. The Secret Doctrine there is in existence today a body of esoteric teaching which is aptly termed the secret doctrine and which for many centuries has been in the keeping of small groups of studious men who have learned its tenets and passed it down largely by word of mouth, though many allegorical texts exist in which it is described. This doctrine holds that the evolution of man will proceed through seven principal races and that we are now living under the great fifth race which began with the civilization in Persia, Egypt, and the Orient. According to the doctrine, the first race of man was largely spiritual. The second began to take on form. The third produced a race of giants that inhabited the continent of Lemuria. The fourth inhabited the continent of Atlantis. And the fifth sought refuge in Europe and Asia after the deluge, referred to esoterically in the Bible in the allegory of Noah's Ark. To produce the materialistic age of today, from whence men will revert once again to spiritual unity through the sixth and seventh races. Those who attempt to substantiate this doctrine maintain that the continent of Lemuria existed in the South Pacific Ocean and offer as evidence the gigantic statues which can be found on Easter Island. These statues are between 27 and 30 feet high and show no evidence of having been built by scaffolding, but appear to have been molded by beings whose stature was approximately the same. As Old Testament of the Bible says, in those days there were giants in the earth. So the adherents of the secret doctrine maintain that colossal beings inhabited the continent of Lemuria, which was swallowed into the sea during the great upheaval in which the earth reversed its poles, leaving nothing above the surface but Easter Island and an archipelago of volcanic rock extending from the Marquesas Islands to New Zealand. These same adherents maintain that the continent of Atlantis was the home of the fourth race of mankind and that this continent existed in the Atlantic Ocean, its easternmost part, where we find the Azores today and extending westward for several thousand miles. The men inhabiting this continent were supposedly 18 feet tall and their civilization was such as to put our present one to shame all of our present scientific advances having been made as well as the development of a culture far exceeding our own. As the secret doctrine has it, Atlantis was destroyed when the earth again reversed its poles. The water rose, 
Atlantis was swallowed into the sea, and its survivors, biblically Noah and his wife and their animals, found their home at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The Tenets of the Secret Doctrine the proponents of the secret doctrine do not advance any reason for the periodic destruction of the various races of man's evolution. Their evidence of the existence of the races is sketchy, to say the least, and they fail to be clear about the author of this plan, which they say has been irrevocably laid down for mankind to follow. But this much they are very firm about, that intelligence and law are the only realities that mankind is evolving toward spiritual oneness, that it is within man's grasp to attain universal consciousness and thus control over all things. The history and course of man's future, as expounded by the secret doctrine, is difficult to accept, but we shall neither affirm nor deny it. Certainly, recorded history takes us scarcely to the doorway of mankind's past, and if the secret doctrine is not correct, it is perhaps as allegorically correct as need be. It is safe to say that man's evolving spirit has inhabited other forms than we know today and that the process of evolution has gone on for perhaps millions of years. It may even be that the earth turns over every so often for the precession of the equinoxes is known to every astronomer, which is simply another way of saying that the earth is slowly wobbling as it spins on its axis. Anyone who has observed a spinning top knows what happens when it begins to wobble in its spin. The secret doctrine also holds that there are superior beings in the universe who are watching and guiding man's evolution on earth, that these beings send their messengers or teachers to our world in the form of adepts, those who evolution has progressed sufficiently to be able to gradually reveal the eternal truths to mankind. According to the proponents of the doctrine, Jesus was one of the adepts, as was Gautama Buddha, as was Plato, and no information is given about what part of the universe is inhabited by those who send their adepts upon the earth, but it is safe to assume that the inference is that these superior beings occupy the planets of our solar system, or else the stars. Life on Other Worlds now, it would be sheer blindness to maintain that higher evolved beings than man do not exist on other worlds in space. Indeed, since our premise is that all form is merely manifold differentiations of one supreme mind, since we believe that all is life and consciousness is everywhere, it logically follows that life exists on other worlds. Has this life evolved to our level or beyond it? We know already that some of the stars, as well as few of the planets, are much older than our sphere. We know that some of the stars have climate conditions that may approximate those of the Earth. As each year brings us closer to the day when space travel becomes a reality, it also brings us closer to the time when many riddles will be answered. How the horizons of man will expand when he reduces the millions of miles of space to a comfortable journey how his thinking will change when he loses himself from the pull of gravity, when the unimpeded acceleration of action in space sets up such blinding speed in his vehicles as to even affect the passage of time. Then, indeed, must man look at the physical worlds about him and know of his unity with the only intelligence and law there is. The Relativity of Matter principle among the provocative phenomena man will encounter when he reaches new worlds is that of the relativity of matter. Today our petroscope reveals the existence on far-flung planets of elements that may weigh as much as hundreds of tons per cubic inch. Consider that man knows matter only in its relative density to his own body. We judge all substance in according to its varying degrees of hardness and softness in other words, its density, and that substance which is least dense and which is still perceptible we call a gas. The air around us is such a gas. As we move about in it, we are aware of it, but we move unimpeded, so relatively scarce is its density in comparison to the density of our own bodies. A being whose bodily density was such that he weighed several hundred tons per cubic inch 
would move through our own bodies with even more ease than we move through the Earth's atmosphere. He would not even be aware of us, for his physical perception would, of necessity, be on an entirely different plane of matter. Such beings may conceivably exist on other worlds than ours, others whose density is so slight as to be negligible in comparison to our own may also conceivably exist on other worlds. Matter is purely relative to the senses that perceive it. In its essence, it is pure intelligence, and it combines into such form as to be perceptible to whatever consciousness is attempting to perceive it. The element which weighs hundreds of tons per cubic inch is made of the same basic stuff as our own atmosphere. Intelligence molds it into form. Intelligence causes its form. Intelligence is its form. Basically, it is neither more nor less than a conception held in the universal subconscious mind. The Relativity of Time Spaceship travel offers another startling promise, that of extreme speed and an entirely new concept of time. In free space, beyond all but a negligible attraction from interstellar bodies, a spaceship would float, orbiting on some gigantic circle around whatever principal interstellar body it happened to be closest to. If a rocket were fired from the rear of this spaceship with such velocity as to create a reaction that accelerated the ship to a speed of 1,000 miles per hour, the spaceship would continue at this speed forever, unless some impeding obstacle or attraction or friction were put in its path. If another similar rocket were fired from the rear of the spaceship, its speed would then reach 2,000 miles per hour. If another were fired, speed would increase to 3,000 miles per hour. If a thousand such rockets were fired, the speed of the ship would be 1 million miles per hour. Indeed, if sufficient numbers of such rockets were conceivably available, the speed of the ship could eventually be accelerated to 186,000 miles per second or 669,600,000 miles per hour. Since this is the speed of light, and according to Einstein a limiting speed, we cannot go beyond it, nor in fact can we ever reach it exactly. His conclusion is that an object increases in size with its speed, and though the effect is negligible at lower velocities, it becomes startling as a mass approaches the speed of light. At this speed, Einstein maintains that a mass would become infinitely large. He also maintains that a minute becomes longer to those who travel at increased velocities, that at the speed of light, time actually stands still. Perhaps this is simply another way of saying that man cannot achieve the speed of light. Perhaps even more than that, it is a method of scientifically describing the complete basic unity of all things in a world where time and space do not exist. One thing is certain, new concepts of space and time and distance and substance will be in sore need the day man becomes free of the pull of Earth's gravity on his first adventure into space. The promise is there. The promise is within the expanding consciousness of the mind of man, who will bridge all space and time, who will truly understand that he is the focal point of all creation. The day he discovers that, all things exist within him. Growing into understanding. We may at this moment seem far adrift for those of you who seek the solution to some specific problem in your life. But you must first understand what mind is. There are no words or formulas that must not first be understood. The key itself is as concise as a diamond, but we must be sure your consciousness has been expanded to the point where you recognize that conception and thought are the alpha and omega of all existence. Patience is the virtue you can best exercise now. Patience and practice of the meditations and thoughtfulness with the conception you are now entertaining and evolving. Concern with space and time and the nature of matter and form are as essential to you in expanding your consciousness as was your original resolve to realize peace and power. Be assured, the road is well planned and charted. 
Reality versus Delusion What remarkable phenomena are the myriad forms about us? Mountains, trees, brooks, seas, meadows, the infinite varieties of animal and vegetable life, the innumerable combinations of minerals, the astounding mechanistic forms made by the hands and ingenuity of man. Their variety and number are awesome. Yet we pass them by regarding them as natural and normal in the scheme of things, giving little or no heed to whence they have come and of what they are made. How sure we often are in our little moments, in our little lives, in our little material worlds. We attach our fleeting securities to the forms around us, vainly try to build up a sense of permanence in a constantly changing material world forgetting the enigma of our births and the inevitability of our deaths as we put our main goals on the accumulation of wealth and goods. Yet, all form is made of the same basic substance as ourselves. Pure and eternal intelligence, the universal subconscious mind, and that mind and all it contains lies within each of us. To a being that weighed 300 tons per cubic inch, the chair in your living room could not exist. He would brush it aside as if it were not there. If he stepped upon it, he would crush it but would never notice it. If the chair simply consists of atoms, with more space between them than in the atoms, and if the atoms themselves contain more space than matter, if we regard matter as nothing more other than pure intelligence, if certain matter, such as the chair, which is such a concrete thing to us, cannot be perceived by a being whose density is millions of times greater, then it is inescapably true that form may exist even though it is not perceived. Form is conception. This is an interesting and important point. Simply because the presence of the chair is not discernible to the being who weighs 300 tons per square inch does not obliterate the existence of the chair. Such a being would perceive only such vibrations of light reflected from substances with a density comparable to his. He would hear only violent vibrations of sound. If one of his fellow beings told him that the chair existed, he would snort and say that if it did, he could see it, hear, feel, or smell it. If one of his fellow beings pointed out to him that the place where the chair stood caused a slight variation in the quality of the light, he would insist that it was all just a crazy idea. But he would know that an idea was involved. That close to the truth, he instinctively would come. The chair would exist for him, but only as a conception. To him, the chair could be only an idea, a thought, which is all that the chair actually is in the first place, a conception in the universal subconscious mind, made of the same substance as the universal subconscious mind. Now, what we are attempting to illustrate is that form is no more than conception, that form is no more than an idea. That form always involves consciousness and that it entirely representative of thought. In its pure essence, form is constructed of exactly the same material from which a thought is constructed. Dual Mind Thus has evolved the duality of our lives and we live upon two planes at once, the plane of mind and thought and the physical plane of things and circumstance. Our education and inhibition have been such as to teach us that thought has evolved in our attempt to deal with things, while the truth is that things are no more than images that represent our thoughts. Such a parallel was drawn by Plato in his cave which represented the world. The men who lived within the cave, by their very nature, could only on the wall of the cave where they observed their shadows cast by the fire behind them. These shadows, they believed, represented the truth about themselves. When one of them turned about and noted that he was being gripped by an illusion, his fellows objected loud and long, labeled him deluded, 
and continued their observation of the flickering shadows. All truth exists within man and never in the world about him. He who studies the world studies effects. He who studies his own mind studies the cause and source of things as they really are. The Fourth Dimension The world of science has long been working along the premise that we fail to grasp the full significance of form, that we do not see and observe a thing for what it really is. This extra quality of things science has labeled the fourth dimension. And many, the tome and treaties have been written in an attempt to tell us in which direction the fourth dimension extends. Since the first three dimensions are each perpendicular to the other, science has insisted that the fourth dimension exists perpendicular to the other three. With our present conception of space, such a fourth perpendicular is obviously impossible, yet science continues its patient attempt to place a fourth perpendicular in space, for it knows that three dimensions cannot possibly answer the cause and the existence of things it is studying. In a gigantic and complex volume entitled Tertium Organum, the Russian writer P. D. Ospensky postulates that life is evolving to the recognition of possibly seven dimensions, that each dimension, when unknown, represents itself as movement. For example, he says that the amoeba lives in one dimension world, that each thing that crosses the line on which his consciousness lives represents to the amoeba only a point. On the next higher scale, the dog lives in a two-dimensional world, seeing and recognizing only width and height. Where the dog observes the presence of the third dimension, it is apparent to him as movement. To round out his conclusion, Ospensky says that we, three-dimensional human beings, are perceiving the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions as movement also. And when man has evolved the full way along the path he travels there will be revealed to him an immobile universe possessing seven dimensions. Thus, Ospensky is able to posit four dimensions more than the normal three, and he finds them all existing in what we know as time, for movement is synonymous with time. Who dares dispute him? The world's greatest mathematical thinker has come to essentially the same conclusion. For he finds matter elongating itself according to its velocity until at the speed of light it is everywhere at the same time, which is all time and any time, for time will then stand still, which is simply Einstein's method of saying that time and space and matter are one when the velocity of movement has reached infinity. A Questing God what are these two outstanding thinkers driving at? Basically, they both see the same thing, that beneath the illusion of separateness, there lies a great unity of all things, a unity in which space and time and individual form are all combined into one, an underlying infinite spirit or an intelligence, the universal subconscious mind. Here, it is reasonable to ask, if this is so, what is the purpose of the illusion of separateness? What is the purpose of individual lives and individual things? And the only reasonable answer at which it is possible to arrive at is that the universal subconscious mind is seeking to know itself by becoming things, that in effect it cannot know itself as infinity. The only possible conclusion is that there is only one purpose behind evolving life, and that purpose is an expanding consciousness. God seeks to know himself by becoming a thing. Thus human evolution is destined to expand self-consciousness to infinity. Viewpoint The riddle of the universe is a riddle pure and simple. Like any other riddle, the true answer depends on a shift in viewpoint. If someone proposes a riddle to you, you put yourself in the place of each of the persons involved in the riddle. You attempt to get each of their viewpoints. When you've gotten each viewpoint, you translate them into one central viewpoint. Then the answer becomes apparent. It is viewpoint that gives us the illusion of separateness in life. 
It is this trick that consciousness plays on us that is forever provoking us into believing that we are negligible in the vast scheme of things. We sense that our consciousness is imprisoned within the fleshy limits of our bodies. And we presume that our personal eyes are forever limited to the few feet of cubic space that our bodies occupy. We see ourselves at the center of a tremendous universe. As far as we can see, in all direction, there is myriad form and infinite variety. The very grains of sand upon a beach refuse to be counted through sheer number. Yet something within us keeps insisting. If I were not conscious and able to observe this, it would not be so. We analyze this statement somewhat sheepishly and admit that somebody else would be observing it, even if we weren't. So it would still have to exist. What we fail to analyze is the personal, restricted, bodily contained I. Who is I? Bill Smith, Jim Jones, Mary Stewart, Every conscious organism and thing that exists refers to itself in exactly the same way. I. When someone says I, he may think that he is referring to his name, where he was born, what he has done, every experience which he has ever had. But what he is actually doing, no more and no less, is simply saying here. He means that thinking consciousness which is in a certain place is having certain thoughts and sensations which it wishes to express through speech or movement. I am hungry. That consciousness which is here wishes to be fed. I wish to go for a walk. That consciousness which is here desires to move somewhere else. More than that, each I is far from being a stable entity, but rather represents hundreds, perhaps thousands, perhaps even millions or billions of eyes. Shakespeare said, All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. And each man in his time plays many parts. Millions of parts are the lot of each person, and every part represents another I on an expanding scale of consciousness. You are not the same I as you were ten years ago, nor are you the same I as you were one week ago. You will not even be the same I when you have finished this chapter. You are only a particular I at a particular moment, and the very next thought that traverses your mind makes you a different I on the succeeding moment. You are always a product of your thought, and represent at any time the sum total of your thought to that moment. Each new thought adds to or detracts from your consciousness. Your I is different from anyone else's in the world, for only you have had the exact train and sequence of thought which make you, you. It is a practical truth that no two people have ever had nor ever will have the exact same train and sequence of thought until human consciousness has been expanded to the conscience of the universal mind. The Illusion of Isolation One of the biggest barriers in the explanation of the unity of life is that a person will say, If true mind is universal and in all things, why am I me? and not someone else or even everyone else. And the only answer which it is possible to give is that you are someone else, and even everyone else, basically. The differences you perceive between yourself and others is simply the difference between the thoughts they have had and the thoughts you have had, for each person is only what he thinks. It is true that your consciousness tends to lock itself within a finite body. And because you tend to say, my consciousness is here and nowhere else, it is difficult for you to perceive that you and your neighbor are one. How much simpler it would be if each thought affecting you and each thought you have had were identical in number and sequence with your neighbors. Your consciousness then would have to be the same. Could there be any doubt in your mind but what you then would both occupy the same body? No two completely identical things exist in the universe. No two grains of sand. No two snowflakes. No two trees. 
for the universe is engaged in making numbers of unlike things from a basic oneness. By its very nature, it cannot make two things which are completely identical. If two conceptions are completely alike, there's only one conception that will produce only one thing. The uniqueness of you. You are what you are only because of what you have thought. Because this thought is different from any person who has ever lived, you are a unique and separate thing in the universe. Most of your thinking is prompted by the sensations that come to you through your five senses. And since these belong to your finite body exclusively, you are constantly building up experience and thought that keep you locked away from oneness with the universal subconscious mind. You tend to see all things about you as being external and different from you. You are, at this stage of evolution, acutely aware of self as a separate, isolated being. But be assured, the path upward leads to expanding that self-consciousness to include all things and all life. The Kingdom of God is Within we must understand that all form and matter represent only the same intelligence that is in us. We must recognize that all this intelligence is ours to draw upon and to understand and use. We must know that thought makes form, that thought makes things, that thought makes us what we are. We must know that our separateness is only of evolving consciousness, that basically there is complete spiritual unity in all life. We must strive constantly to expand our consciousness by identifying ourselves with everything and everyone about us. We must search in our quiet hours for contact with the universal subconscious mind, where all information and all thought have been indelibly impressed, which can guide us unerringly along paths of attainment and knowledge. We must understand the invincible power of thought how it makes us what we are, how it creates form and brings in circumstance, how it underlies and moves the universe. We must guard ourselves from being exposed to negative thinking. We must refuse to accept negative circumstance. We must, in our complete and positive expansion, in our soaring knowledge of the mighty work of the mind, Teach our children to control their thinking. Teach our neighbors to control their thinking. Teach a suffering mankind that the way out of each of its dilemma lies in the vehicle of its own thought. That the millennium is here. That the kingdom of God is within every one of us. Mind is greater than all. As you look about you at the panorama of your life, at the things that concern you, at the circumstances that involve you, expand your consciousness to include them as living parts of the fluidic medium in which you live. See through your own eyes a manifold living universe which is constantly expressing itself by becoming an infinite number of things. Sense your complete oneness with each of these things. Know that the only real truth is intelligence, and the only real form is thought. Somewhere, behind the barriers established by your habits of thought, there exists the consciousness of the whole, the intelligence that knows all things, the universal subconscious mind. Nothing is impossible to this mind. All its guidance and power are available to you. When you have fully realized that thought causes all, you will know that there can never be limits on you that you yourself do not impose. As we work more and more with intelligence and consciousness, we will learn to disregard size in relation to our own bodies by simply understanding that physical form and physical size have little or nothing to do with expanding consciousness. We may look on the vastness of space and the eternities of time with utter composure in the knowledge that mind alone is the answer to all things and mind never be limited by space and time. Because a star lies a million light years away does not mean that you are small in the scheme of things. Does not your mind traverse this tremendous distance in an instant? See the power and scope of this mind of yours. 
so swiftly it dwarfs your body, with such great power inherent in his very being, is it not the most worst of all evils for a man to place no trespassing signs on all avenues of thought, and thus limit himself into poverty, disease, limitation, and lack of every kind? Nothing is impossible. All things are probable. Whatever the mind can conceive, the mind can do. Whatever the mind conceives, the mind does. There is only one way the path of evolution leads. Upwards. There is no limit to the heights to be assailed, short of union with God. Man is the center of the universe. Our home is a whirling ball amongst whirling balls in ringed space. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, eternal captives of the Sun, move in the immutable paths of infinite law. They are only specks in space. If the Sun were a mile in diameter, Mercury would be 15 feet across and 36 miles away. Venus would be 38 feet across and 67 miles away. Earth would be 40 feet across and 93 miles away. Mars would be 20 feet across and 140 miles away. Jupiter would be 400 feet across and 483 miles away. And the last of the planets, Pluto, would be 20 feet across and 3,700 miles away. And this is but one of an infinite number of solar system. He who is a materialist and would account for life as an accident amid the immeasurableness of material form, is accounting for nothing. So small is man relative to the universe. Such a one may feel and touch his physical possessions each day, much as Midas counted his gold. But when his spirit lays down his physical form and departs, he knows not where. It provides no entourage or vans or railroad cars for the transport of those things upon which the materialist has founded his truths. Matter and substance and form are but instruments of our thought, but pawns in a reaching game of expanding mind, much as chess players might play their game in their heads, were it not so much easier to do it with a playing board and chess pieces. Man is the center of the universe, not in physical size assuredly, but in mind. For the universal subconscious mind is everywhere at the same time, and all of it is at any place, at any time, and all of it is in man now. The Mighty Tool Form proceeds from mind, and mind controls all, and this knowledge properly applied can change your life. No longer need you batter at circumstance and things. No longer need you rail at the dealings of fate or frustrate your life against unwanted circumstance. Everything proceeds from mind. Everything proceeds from thought. And miracles are wrought in quiet hours in still rooms when awakened souls hearken their divinity. You as a person know you exist because you think. And these thoughts of yours are far and away the most important thing you do. They are, in fact, the only thing you do. These thoughts of yours are the essence that makes form, that brings circumstance. They are your sole tool with which to expand your consciousness. Accordingly, there is no more paramount thing for you to do than carefully select those thoughts that you will think those beliefs you will adopt, those attitudes you will take for your own. For by them you will be what you will be. By them you have arrived exactly where you are today. If you mean for your life to be progressive and full of achievement, vigor, love, and abundance, you will abandon each negative thought the moment it is presented to you. You will refuse to accept on the plane of mind any conception other than those that are in tune with good. You will think only positively, and the universe will shower you with more good than you ever dreamed. Review Number 1. Basic and eternal in the universe are everlasting laws of action. 2. A vibrating universe acting upon itself evolves centers of force such as are represented by the atom and by the solar system. 3. 
These centers of force seek other centers of force with similar vibrations and by their coalescence matter is formed. 4. Since intelligent law makes up the center of force, the atom, which is the building block of the universe, is conscience. 5. We have our beings in the midst of a living universe. 6. There is no such thing as inanimate matter, for all form is made from universal intelligence and is but a conception in the universal subconscious mind. 7. That matter which we call living is simply that which has evolved sufficiently so that its consciousness is discernible to our senses. 8. That process which all life is caught up in is universal intelligence seeking to know itself by becoming a thing. 9. Evolution is the path of expanding consciousness. 10. Developed self-consciousness, such as is now possessed by man, is a necessary step toward the development of universal consciousness. 11. Man's destiny is to expand his consciousness to complete unity, to a oneness with God. 12. Form proceeds from intelligence, for form is intelligence, therefore form proceeds from thought, and thought makes things. 13. All life is but an incarnation of the one life. Therefore, there are innumerable reincarnations until unity with the universal subconscious mind is obtained. 14. The secret doctrine has been held inviolate by esoteric groups for many ages and teaches that mankind is evolving toward spiritual unity. 15. The secret doctrine lays down the past and future of man's evolution, but this cannot be accepted as substantiated. 16. Matter is only relative and is nothing more than a combination of centers of force or moving intelligence. 17. Space and time are also relative and represent concepts in the universal subconscious mind. 18. Man lives upon two planes at once the plane of mind and thought, and the plane of things and circumstance. But actually, these two planes are only one. 19. Your I is a product of your thought and is never the same from one moment to the next, except insofar as it is confined within the fleshly limits of your body. 20. The real I is eternal, everlasting, only one, and contains all things. 21. The kingdom of God is within us. 22. You are what you think, and thoughts are things. Therefore, select your thoughts with care. Patience. Still, we have not come to grips with concrete problems in concrete lives. And two more chapters are to be read before we undertake to teach specifically how to apply the laws of mind to the realms of love, success, and health. We moderns are an impatient people, and always the first thing we want to know is, what does it do? Then, the minute we find out, we want to get on with it as quickly as possible. We would like to be laymen one day and doctors of medicine the next unnoticed one week and famous the following, and even when we recognize this sort of thing as a possible miracle, we forget the workers of miracles must serve their apprenticeships also. It would be foolish to teach the powers of the mind without first getting it thoroughly understood what the mind is. It could be folly to undertake the vast and exciting subject that engrosses us without recognizing that if such answers were obvious, they would long ago have been in widespread use by all mankind. Bear with us. The groundwork must be thoroughly laid. The Infallible Law The Infallible Law You must understand that the teachings of this book are not to be regarded as patent medicines or wonder drugs, things that work most of the time or some of the time or not at all. The law 
this book teaches works all of the time. And nothing or nobody on the face of the earth is big enough to stop it from working. We didn't make this law. We neither start it nor stop it. Our only purpose here is to impart to you a knowledge of its existence and methods of using it. The law works 100% of the time. It never fails. If you apply it to achieve success and you meet with failure, it isn't the law that has failed. It is you. You have simply failed to do the one thing it is necessary for you to do to attain the slightest good, and that is to think only positively of that good. If an opposite develops, it has developed because you have been more convinced of it than you have of the good you want, and the law has still worked, as it always must. The cynic is his own worst enemy. It requires far less skill to run a wrecking company than it does to be an architect. The world has been built by builders, and those who destroy have no alternative other than to dwell in desolation. Throughout the world, there are working groups who are envisioning the arrival of the kingdom of God and man, who see in the thinking mind of man the object of his own liberation. Thoughts are things, they say. Things are thoughts. Awaken, man, to your sovereignty over all. Cast aside your enemies, doubt, morbidity, fear, and guilt. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. You cannot dream a dream too big, nor aspire too high. Nothing is impossible. In our fourth meditation, we are recognizing that all form and circumstance are but manifestations of the universal mind, that everything and everyone is made from and has his being in universal intelligence. Everything which you can conceive and accept is yours. Entertain no doubt. Refuse to accept worry or hurry or fear. That which knows and does everything is inside you and hearkens to the slightest whisper. Recommended Reading The Consciousness of the Atom by Alice A. Bailey Published by the Lucas Publishing Company Fourth Meditation I know that all life exists within me, here in my heart and mind, in the recesses of my being, there is utter calm, a place of unruffled and placid waters, where the truth is apparent and the clamor of the world does not exist. I see about me the thoughts of all mankind, for these thoughts have become things. Whatever is good among these thought things, I accept. Whatever is evil, I ignore. For my concern is only with truth and understanding, which is forever the lovely and the good and the expanding. My mind moves easily to the furthermost reaches of space, in all directions, and just as easily moves back to me once again. I am the center of the universe. God, the universal subconscious mind, has made himself manifest through me. I know that my purpose in life is to reach ever upward and outward, to expand in knowledge and love and unity. I place my future in divine hands. I turn over each problem of my life to that great all-knowing mind to which all things are possible. I do not tell God how to bring these things about. I have complete confidence that every circumstance that comes my way is part of a perfect plan to convert the image of my faith into physical reality. Even now the universe seeks to answer my every need. As I believe in my heart, so shall it be done unto me. This is the law of life and of living. There is greatness in my friend and in my enemy, for we are all brothers seeking the same high mountain along many paths. God, who made all creatures, made no poor creature, for he made only of himself. 
I am prosperous for God owns everything. I am vigorous for God is all vigor. I need only open my mind and my heart, keep my thoughts in the path of truth, and I am filled to overflowing with the power and abundance and love of the universe. End of chapter 4 All right, my dear friend. If I may ask, please do hit that like button. Also, I want to make a special note of the beautiful artwork that you see on this particular video. I do have it in my description. It is by Alex Gray. You'll see the link in the description again, as I mentioned. And also the recommended readings. Make sure that you scour through the book playlist and see if you can um, find them there as well. Again, thank you so much for being a part of this journey. Leave me your comments. Let me know you were here. And share this video with your friends. Let's lift each other up. All right. Head over to the next video where I will be there with Chapter 5. Intuition.